Hey, everybody. I was waiting for the music to end, but it didn't end. I do just realize now, somebody said the chairs are a little funny this morning, and they are really funny. They should be shifted this way a little bit more. Grace, and your, your, it's not your fault. It was mine. He had them set up last night, and I came in this morning and messed them all up. I won't ever do that again. I'm sorry. Okay. Hey, it's good to have you guys here this morning. Good morning. Got a couple of things for you before we get into God's Word this morning. By the way, uh, my name is Daniel. I'm the lead pastor here at Woodlands Church, and I am thankful that you guys are here this morning. Um, if it's your first or second time here at Woodlands Church, we just always like to take a second to just give you a special welcome. We know it's not always easy to walk into a church on a Sunday morning. Maybe it's been a year or 10 years or 20 years, or maybe there's been some things going on in your life that have made it difficult to connect with the Lord, and we just want to say Thank you for being here this morning, and we are so glad that you are here. One of the things that you can do for us, if you're a first or second time guest, is fill out one of those connection cards that popped up on the screen. Again, you can find those in the in the carts in the uh, in the aisles. Fill it out. On your way out, you can go to this table over here. There'll be a couple of really friendly ladies over there, and they have a gift just to say thank you for worshiping with us um, this morning. Um, here's something else I want to mention to you. Talked about it last week, and I'm going to talk about it again this week and probably next week too. We need the body of Christ to step up all around, all around us. We have, we are blessed to have so many faithful volunteers who serve here at Woodlands regularly, but we have some needs here. We need some servants who are willing to step up in the name of Jesus because they feel like it's their time and their calling to serve this body. Specifically, some of our needs are we need four people um, right away in the children's minute, right away in the children's ministry. I walked up there right as the countdown um, was happening, and they're doing a great job up there. There's probably four or five volunteers up there right now, but man, your guys' kids, wow. Okay, so, so man, if a few of you guys would be willing to volunteer, by the way, when we ask you to volunteer for something here at Woodlands Church, we're just asking you to volunteer one Sunday a month. Like, we're not going to rope you into teaching first graders for every week for the next 52 weeks. It's one week a month we're asking you to give. We need four volunteers immediately. Another big need is, is we need at least two more volunteers in our youth ministry. Our youth ministry is growing. It meets here on Wednesday nights, by the way, um, at 6.30. We need a couple, particularly we need a couple of men from our church to step up into leadership um, and to volunteer in our youth ministry. And one of the things I kind of want to help you do over these next couple of weeks is I want you to meet some people who are volunteering in our church and just hear why they have chosen to serve. Last week, you got to hear from Julie, our children's director. Um, today, you get to hear from Adam, Adam and Katie Hernandez. So go ahead and show their uh, video. Hi, my name's Katie, and I work with my husband. Adam. <laughs> um, in hospitality. So we are the ones that set up the coffee and we try to be on time. Freshly uh, brewed. Yes, freshly brewed. <laughs> and we provide the donuts and vegan as well. Um, and get the waters ready and just have some refreshments for you folks in the morning so when you arrive you have a little something in your tummy so you're ready to worship. So initially we began serving um, because we were kind of thrown into the role because one of the folks that we care about deeply got into an accident, a car accident, um, but it quickly became an amazing opportunity for us to serve the community, the church, um, and God. And um, we just kind of, it was kind of a little push that we needed because we had been wanting to serve for quite a long time, but just really kind of went around not having the time or, you know, life gets busy. Um, so it was kind of, um, a blessing for us because we are doing what we love and we're able to provide that to our to our community and our church family and we love doing it it's just it's an awesome feeling to be able to serve our church community and our family and that's just something small that we are able to do and we love to do it mm -hmm. so if you're interested and finding a place in our church that you can help serve. Hospitality is always looking for some helpers. We would love if we could find four helpers to help us 
help the community church um, and our church family and just be able to help set up um, the refreshments in the morning and don't be discouraged there's actually a checklist that we have that helps kind of go through and set everything up and how to do it and we'll be there to help you every step of the way By the way, they do, a, they do a great job. I don't know if you've been back there, but not only is the coffee good, but the, uh, the snacks are off the hook and it's showing in my waistline. <laughs> so uh, thank you guys for doing that. Hey, um, if you could see yourself as an Adam and Katie who are thinking, man, I want to I serve my church, but I don't know where to get started. Uh, I, I think what she said and what Adam said is so, so true. Like, Take the opportunity to jump in and serve. Like, you hear me asking because we need help, but the blessing isn't ours. The blessing will be yours to serve your body and to bless others. And so um, on your way out today, if you want to serve in any capacity, again, there will be a couple of ladies over here at these tablets. You can sign up for hospitality, children's ministry. Um, you can sign up for youth ministry. Uh, there's also other opportunities that you can sign up for. And if you're not sure where to serve, just let the ladies know that. They'll take your name and number, and one of us will call you and say, hey, here's the opportunities we have to serve. So um, with that, why don't I pray for us, and then we will get into God's word this morning. Father, I'm thankful for a body of believers who serve. Lord, in, in many churches, it's a few people who do all the work. But Father, at Woodlands, you have raised up an army of people who serve faithfully week in and week out. So Father, I'm thankful for each one of them. Father, what I pray you would put into these people's hearts in this moment would be a desire to serve if they're not serving, a conviction to serve if they're not serving. And Father, help them to find just the right role and just the right place to serve this body and to serve this community. Now, Father, we pray you would quiet our hearts. Lord, not a one of us came in here this morning. Not a one of us came in here without thoughts, worries, burdens, stress. But Father, now these moments are yours. And we pray that your spirit would work in our hearts, minds, souls, and lives in these moments as we hear your word. Father, speaking of your word, Lord, may, may the words not be mine, may they be yours. Father, may what's spoken here be what you want to be spoken, and I pray that over us, that, Father, what would be said is honoring and glorifying to you, and Father, if there's anything that you don't want me to say, Father, I just pray you would take it out of my memory, and Father, we just say, use us, work in us, move in us, in Jesus' name, amen. Hey, you guys, I brought my Bible to church. And you should have brought yours too. So I hope you have it. Get it out and open up to Luke chapter 20. Luke chapter 20. Um, If you don't have a Bible, you are totally welcome to jump out of your seat right now and grab one of our Bibles that are in the carts in the aisles. And you are welcome to borrow that this morning. Or if you need a copy of God's word, you are also welcome to keep one of those Bibles as a gift from us to you. If you need a new copy of God's word, or maybe you don't have one at all, you're totally welcome to have that. We think one of the most important things we can do for you here at Woodlands Church is to make sure that God's word is in your hand, in your head, and in your heart. So that's why we think it's important that everybody has a copy of God's word. Uh, Imagine with me for a second. Imagine with me Imagine with me wanting something so bad that you would do something wrong to get it. Imagine imagine with me for a second wanting and loving power so much that you would commit a crime to receive it. Imagine that rage and that desire and that jealousy bubbling over so much out of your heart and your mind that it would even lead you to a place where you were willing to take someone's life. We'll meet Jesus in Jerusalem. That's the story that we have been on for over a year now of learning about Jesus' life from the very beginning until, well, now we're nearing the very end. Where we're at in the story is we are after Palm Sunday. Palm Sunday is the day in which we celebrate Jesus entering Jerusalem for the last time, the time in which he is going to be in Jerusalem for about a week, and then he's going to be arrested and crucified. And where we're at here in Luke chapter 20 is he is right in the middle of his last few days of life before the cross. 
He has been preaching, he's been teaching, he's been instructing, uh, and, and, and all of this has kind of culminated to this moment during this story where Jesus is in Jerusalem, his followers are with him, but the leaders of the city, which we talked a bit about this last week, they're, they're both religious and they're both political, which doesn't make for a very good mix. They want him removed. And they're at the point where they're willing to do just about anything they can to get Jesus out of their midst. And so that's where we pick up the story is in Luke 20, verses 27 through 37. So we're going to read like 10 verses right now. It's going to be long. I promise you something. We're going to get done, be, be done reading it. And you're going to say, what in the world did I just read? But I'm going to help us with that to the best of my ability this morning. So Luke 20, verses 27 through 37. There came to him some Sadducees, those who deny that there's a resurrection. And they asked him a question, saying, Teacher, Moses wrote for us that if a man's brother dies, having a wife but no children, the man must take the widow and raise up offspring for his brother. Now there were seven brothers. The first took a wife and died without children. And the second and the third took her. And likewise, all seven left no children and died. Afterward, the woman, woman also died. In the resurrection, therefore, whose wife will this woman be? For the seven had her as wife. And Jesus said to them, The sons of this age marry and are given in marriage. But those who are considered worthy to attain to that age and to the resurrection from the dead neither marry nor are given in marriage. For they cannot die anymore because they are equal to angels and are sons of God, being sons of the resurrection." But that the dead are raised, even Moses showed in the passage about the bush, where he calls the Lord the God of Abraham, and the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. We're going to stop there for a second, and we're going to kind of unpack this, because there's a lot there, and it's a story that we're not familiar with. Have you noticed as we've, as we've ventured through Jesus' life, probably 80% of the stories are super familiar, right? Well, this is one of those 20% of which we read it, we're like, what are we even hearing here? And I'm going to try to help us with that to the best of my ability, uh, help us understand what Jesus is doing and teaching here. Uh, first of all, let's talk about the Sadducees. You hear this word Sadducees? Maybe you've heard that word, maybe you haven't, but you've definitely heard of Pharisees, right? They're like the evil ones of the Bible. They're the ones that we always say, these are the ones, it was the Pharisees that, that arrested, had Jesus arrested, and eventually it was their fault that he was put on the cross. Well, that's the Pharisees. The Sadducees are a different group of guys, but they are the arch rival of the Pharisees. And they have some different beliefs about them, but they, they, they shared something in common, which we're going to get to in a second, but otherwise they were very different. A little bit about the Sadducees, just so we have a little bit of, a little bit of background about the Sadducees. Um, first of all, all they believed in was the first five Bible, books of the Bible. It's called the Pentateuch. It's just the first five books. That's all they believed. And Jesus mentioned this uh, when I just read a second ago, but they didn't believe in heaven, they didn't believe in eternity, they didn't believe in resurrection, and so there was a lot of things that we believe and that even the Pharisees believed that the Sadducees did not believe. And finally, the other thing that they believed about God is that he was a distant, disconnected, and hands-off God. But the Pharisees and the Sadducees kind of got together, and this is why, because they both had a common problem. They both had this man by the name of Jesus that was causing them big problems. Both of these parties, both of these men, groups of men, they wanted power, they wanted money, they wanted authority, they wanted fame, they wanted to be popular. And you know what happened when Jesus came into Jerusalem? All of these people were hearing a new word, a new word about the gospel, a new word about life, and boy, they were they just hated Jesus and what he did and what he was saying and what he was teaching. And so that gives you a little bit of background about the Sadducees. So why are the Sadducees asking Jesus an odd question? Well, they kind of come up with this riddle, and this is why. They were tired. They were tired of this man, Jesus, taking the things away from them that they wanted. And so what they wanted to do is they wanted to catch Jesus up. They wanted to catch Jesus in uh, breaking the law or breaking the word of God or teaching something that was wrong. And so they give Jesus this riddle, which is kind of an odd one. Did you catch it? The riddle kind of goes like this. They say, hey, Jesus, we've got a question for you about the resurrection. 
which by the way is odd because they didn't even believe in the resurrection. But they said, hey Jesus, you know that law in the, in the Old Testament? There's this law in the Old Testament that says if a man marries a woman, but before they have children, the man dies, that his brother has to marry and have children. And they said, you know Jesus, here's the riddle. Not one husband, but then the second, and then the third brother, and then the fourth brother, and then the fifth brother, and the sixth brother, and the woman never has any children. And then after the seventh husband, the woman dies, and they say, we're going to get this guy, because he's not going to have an answer. And they say, the woman dies. So in heaven, whose wife will the woman be? Which of the seven brothers? Now, what I appreciate about Jesus here is he, he just jumps straight to it. He doesn't even really heed the question all that much or engage it really all that much. He just says, she won't. She won't. And we get to learn a little bit about heaven here, by the way. In heaven, Jesus says that there is no marriage. And one of the questions I think we often talk about, and maybe it happens uh, when we're surrounded by death or at a funeral or at a memorial, and we always wonder, well, will I, will I, will I recognize my family? Will my family be waiting at the gates for me? Will, 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 will my husband be there? Will my wife be there? Will my grandma and my grandpa be there? And, and will I know them? And well, I, I can't make a strong case other than to say, I think that you'll recognize them. But it's going to be so much different. And I wanted to take this moment as Jesus is speaking about heaven and these Sadducees are asking questions about heaven and eternity and resurrection. I wanted to take a moment to just peek into heaven this morning. Like just to take a look at what, what is heaven and what is it going to look like and what is it going to be like. And by the way, in the Bible, that's all we get. We only get these little glimpses and these little pictures of heaven. There's, there's not a whole book of the Bible that describes heaven from beginning to end. It's just we get these little peaks of it. And I want to tell you just a little bit about it this morning since Jesus is talking about it. First and foremost, heaven is going to be entirely, totally, and fundamentally different than this world we live in. Completely different. I think this is one of the reasons why the Bible doesn't so often talk about heaven. Because in our human terms, all we can think about are the things around us. And I just told somebody up in the cafe 30 minutes ago before service, I said, don't we live in a little piece of heaven on earth? And they're like, yeah, but we're moving to Yukaipa. <laughs> Where are you guys at? Where are you at? You're here somewhere. <laughs> I said, that's not heaven. But God bless your journey. Listen, let me tell you why it's fundamentally different. Everything in this world, no matter how beautiful that we think it is, and no, no matter how wonderful we think our body of believers is, and no matter how wonderful our relationships with one another are, man, do you know our world is gripped by sin and it is totally broken? Everything about it. Everything about our world is tarnished and destroyed by the sinfulness of which we live in. Hey, we get moments of beauty. We get moments of seeing this glorious place that we get to live in. We go on vacation and we see awesome beaches and beautiful forests and alpine lakes. And we say, man, I imagine that this is what heaven is going to be like. But let me tell you. The most beautiful thing that you have seen or could imagine on this planet is a pale glimmer of what heaven will be like someday. The best moment that you have had on this planet, the most beautiful thing that you have ever seen, the best day of your life is like a candle blown out on a birthday cake in comparison to heaven because sin will not exist in that place. Do you understand what sin does to our world? Do you understand what sin does to your life? It changes, tarnishes, and messes up everything about it. It causes us to be jealous. It causes us to lust. It causes us to lie. It causes us to cheat, to steal, to be dishonest. And one thing after another after another. And now we live in a world that's like the world that we live in. But here's heaven. And I'm going to give you permission today to daydream. Like just daydream for me, with me for a second. Like daydream, every hurt, every burden, every suffering, 
Everything that is broken, every time you have been hurt or hurt somebody before, every bad memory, every regret, every burden, gone forever and in eternity, probably not even to be remembered. Do you want to understand what heaven is like? Take everything bad out of this planet, put God's beauty and creation in it, and that is what heaven is. Man, maybe, maybe you've just been wrestling with marriage stuff. That's gone in heaven. Maybe you've wrestled with addiction. Maybe you've wrestled with a divorce. Maybe alcoholism. Maybe cancer. Maybe the sudden tragic death of a loved one, a spouse, a grand, whatever, right? None of that exists in heaven. It is all gone forever. No sin, no darkness. It's all wiped away. And here's the even better part. Everything that separates you from the almighty God is gone. We will now have perfect fellowship with God in heaven. Go back to the beginning. In the beginning, when Adam and Eve walked in the Garden of Eden with God in perfect fellowship. That is a picture of our perfect fellowship with God. And check this one out, and here's the real miracle. Perfect fellowship with God and perfect fellowship with one another. And we know how, how impossible that is, right? We know how miraculous that would be on a planet like this one for us to have perfect relationship with one another. Man, that's what it's going to be like. I got some really good insights in my small group this week, too, with some of the things some of the people were sharing one of the things that one of the ladies in my group said is, is she said, you know, Jesus says, I'm going away to prepare a place for you, and heaven is going to be personal. Now, now, do I get to create what I want? Like, Ken and I talked about this, right, Ken? Like, we'd love there to be a football field there, like the song, right, in God's house. I won't sing it for you. Big, big house, that's what it is, with lots and lots of food. Me and Nathan are on that bandwagon. Ken and, I want to play some, Ken and I want to play some football. Listen, heaven is going to be personal because God prepares a place for us. But let me tell you something. It's not going to be filled with football fields. Let me tell you what it is going to be filled with. I cannot wait until we get back into the book of Revelation. Which, by the way, if you've counted pages, we're in uh, Luke chapter 20. That's page 1046 of my Bible. And we've got until page 1,230, and I get through about a quarter of a page a week. Somebody can do the math on that. The book of Revelation is a long way away for us, but I cannot wait to get to the book of Revelation. It's one of my favorite books to preach because we get a picture of God and of Jesus and of heaven that blows our mind. But let me just tell you what the Bible says very quickly from the book of Revelation. This guy by the name of John, he gets a vision of heaven, and you know what? It's so glorious and so wonderful and so beyond anything of human comprehension that he lacks the words to even communicated and he just says this is beautiful and glorious and majestic it's beyond anything that I can imagine and the picture that we get at the beginning of the book of Revelation is of a throne room a place where all of God's saints all of the angels and all of the heavenly bodies gather together and do you know what they're doing they're not eating they're not playing football. Do you know what they're doing in heaven at this very moment? Here is the picture of heaven. They are falling on their faces in front of a righteous and holy God and pouring out their heart to him singing, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. That church is what heaven is going to look like. And in that place, not only is God preparing a place for us, not only are we going to be in a throne room with him, with every saint that has ever been on this planet, but in that place we will also be his very sons and his very daughters, like he has said all throughout Scripture. Perfect, unbroken relationship, unbroken fellowship. And one of my favorite passages in the book of Revelation, I think it comes from Revelation 21, this is just declared, this place, heaven, will be a place where God is with his people and there will be no more sin, there will be no more tears, there will be no more pain, there will no longer be any suffering and no sickness and no sorrow for all of the former things will be wiped away. I told you to daydream and imagine heaven with me, but let me tell you, whatever picture just got painted in your head, 
whatever great and glorious picture of heaven just got planted in your head, it is infinitely better than even that because man's words fail on the beauty and the majesty and the glory of heaven. Back to the story, verses 38 through 40. Verses 38 through 40. Oh, verse 38 is a good one. Now he is not God of the dead, but of the living, for all live to him. Then some of the scribes answered, Teacher, you've spoken well. For they no longer dared to ask him any questions. Remember, they're trying to trip Jesus up. They're trying to catch him in a lie or a misstep. They're trying to catch him breaking the law or doing something against God's word. And you know what these men do? After this great riddle that they put together about one wife and two brothers and seven brothers and who's going to be the, the, the wife and the husband in resurrection, do you know what they do? They say, huh, that's a good answer. And then it says, they shut up. I know that's a little crass on a Sunday morning, but it's true. Jesus spoke truth to these men, and all they could say is, good answer. We're not going to ask any more questions. But I love verse 38, where Jesus says, the God that, the God that you think you worship, my Father... He says, he is not the God of the dead, but he is the God of the living. Oh, church, I love this verse. There's a, it's a couple layers deep, and I want to tell you about this. Number one, Jesus is correcting bad theology. Theology is what we believe about God. Theology is what we believe about the Bible. He's correcting bad theology because, remember, these Sadducees, they thought life was it. After death, there's no heaven, there's no hell, there's no eternity, there's no resurrection. And he looks these men in the eyes and says, I have something to tell you. My father is not dead. Our God, church, is not dead. He is alive. And while Jesus, after this, will go to the cross and die and be dead for three days, he will be risen again. And so he looks these men in the eyes and says, while it may look like I'm defeated for a moment, while it may look like death has overcome me, let me assure you of something. I will be resurrected. I will live. My Father lives. We, I am not the God of the dead, but I am the God of the living. And if I could add just a little something to it, the same is true for anyone in this room who believes in Jesus Christ as their Savior. Though you might have a couple of moments at the end of your life where you're in a little bit of pain, you might have a couple of moments where you gasp for air and you wish you weren't laying in that bed. Do you know what's going to happen? You're going to close your eyes and then you're going to wake up in the heaven that we just talked about. And you're going to forget those couple of moments of pain and suffering. Because what you are in is going to be so glorious. And I feel like I need to say one other thing here. And maybe it goes without saying, but sometimes we need to have a longer view. We need to have, have a bigger view of life. Do you know this daily battle that you're all wrestling through? This daily battle to live right, to follow Jesus, to have a, to have a God-honoring marriage, to raise kids that love the Lord, to make disciples, to be generous, to love others. You understand that this isn't just about this planet, right? Like you're not just trying to be a good person, so that you have a couple of comfortable lives on this planet. Like you're not just trying to, to scratch out a nice existence on earth for your 50 or 60 or 70 or 80 or 90 years. Do you understand that when the call is to follow Jesus and be righteous, it's not about a couple of years on this planet, which is here today and gone tomorrow. It's about eternity. Church, have eternity in your eyes. When you're making decisions and when you're trying to live for the Lord, but the, the, you know what's oftentimes the easiest thing to do? The, the evil way, the sinful way, the dark way. That's the easy thing. When you're trying to make those decisions, don't just have earth in view. Have eternity in view. Because when you have eternity in view, it's much easier to make a decision of, man, this would be easier right now. But I know where this takes me if I just stay on the path with the Lord. By the way, I think this is why Jesus talks so much about the kingdom. If you went back through the Gospel of Luke, he just talks about the kingdom, the kingdom of heaven, my Father's kingdom, over and over again, because believers, 
We cannot be focused on our 70 or 80 years on this planet. Our eyes need to be on his kingdom, which, by the way, is our final destination. Like, that's where we're headed. Our final destination isn't Crestline or Ukaipa or whatever, right? Like, <laughs> I'm just going to keep at it. See if I can work it in one more time. <laughs> like, our final destination is heaven, church. It's heaven. So that's layer one of our God being alive. Here's the second part of it. The God that we serve, the God that we worship, he is not distant. He is not dead. He is not disinterested. Our God is alive and understand that not only is he alive, but our God, if we believe the word of God, if we believe the Bible, our God is right here in our midst. He is closer than a brother. His presence dwells not only in this place, but he dwells in the hearts of each one of us who are believers. Don't miss this. When we stand here and sing and people walk by and they think, wow, those people are weirdos. We are not just singing to these logs in the ceiling. We are singing to a God that is present with his people. We are lifting up the name of the God who dwells in your heart, who leads you, guides you, loves you, protects you, and watches over you. His very spirit, the spirit of the creator, the spirit of God dwells within us. Paul says in these jars of broken clay, the spirit dwells within us. I want to read you another scripture. You don't have to turn there. It'll come up on this screen. This passage has been on my heart for the last couple of weeks. And I think think that it helps us understand the closeness of God. It's going to be a passage that you're all familiar with. It's Psalm 23. Can you throw it up there for me? The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads, me, he leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemy. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. I know you have all heard that before, but I want you to see the closeness in this. God is ever close. Here's some of the excerpts of that. It says that God leads me. He leads me to rest in peace. He restores and he refreshes my soul He shepherds me towards towards righteousness. He provides for me. He pours out blessing in his Holy Spirit so much so that the Bible says our cup overflows he pours out so much. And it says he chases me down with his goodness and mercy. Our God is not distant. He is not far away. He is not dead. He is not disinterested. He is not disengaged. Our God is with us. He is personal and he is relational. This God that you hear me talk about, this God that you hear me read from, from the Bible, this God that we sing these songs to, he is not dead. He is not distant. He is none of those things. It is quite the opposite. He is with us and in us. And around us, and leading us, and protecting us, and guiding us, and comforting us, and restoring us, even when, the Bible says, we walk through the valley of the shadow of death. I'm going to come back to that in a couple minutes. Verses 41 through 44, if you still have your Bibles open. Verses 41 through 44. So Jesus speaks again. He says, but... But he said to them, how can they say that the Christ is David's son? For David himself says in the book of Psalms, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. David thus calls him Lord. So how is he his son? You know what's interesting here is that Jesus pushes in. You know, he could have just let the Sadducees walk away at this point. He'd already quieted them. 
They'd already said, Jesus, that's a great answer. We got no more words for you. But Jesus presses in with a little bit more truth. And kind of interestingly, he actually offers his own little riddle. And it's a little confusing. And if you're not an Old Testament scholar, I'm not. I had to read about this this week. If you ever wondered, I don't know any of the things that I tell you about until I learn about it that week, okay? So, like, I'm just, I'm six days ahead of you. That's it. <laughs> You'd have to be an Old Testament scholar, which I am not, to understand. But here's what Jesus is saying. And by the way, the Sadducees and the Pharisees that were there listening, they would have known exactly what Jesus was saying because they were all about the word of God. Their hearts weren't about Jesus. Their hearts were not about God, but they knew all about his word. And this is what Jesus is getting at. He's saying, you guys know that the Messiah is supposed to come from the line, from the family of King David. Yeah, that King David that's all throughout the Bible. David and Goliath, he becomes king, right? The Bible tells us that the Messiah is supposed to come from David's line. And Jesus says, but here's a weird question. Can you answer it for me? then why does King David, who would have been the ancestor of the Messiah, call the Messiah in Scripture Lord, Master? And there's only one answer. There's only one answer. For them, it would have been one plus one equals two. One plus one equals two, which in this moment equals Jesus. What they're saying to, what he is saying to these men is, You don't think that I'm the Messiah? He's saying, put the pieces together. I'm standing right in front of you. I am the Savior from David's line. I have fulfilled all of these prophecies coming to Jerusalem. You know who I am. The practical significance here is this. Jesus pressed into the truth of God's word. He pressed into the truth that he was the Messiah. And do you know what it gets him? Do you know what it gets him pushing into truth? It gets him death. It gets him the cross. Do you know it is this thing that they end up crucifying Jesus for? Do you know they bring him in front of the court? They bring him in front of the court, and none of the charges stick until Jesus opens his mouth and declares that he is the Messiah. And it is for that thing that they correct, they, that they um, accuse him and that they convict him for and put him on the cross. And so here's the question. Why in the world would you do this? Why would Jesus not just let the Sadducees and the Pharisees walk away? Why would he push further into this? Well, it's because righteousness matters more than comfort. Righteousness matters more than comfort. And if you want to talk about something that's uncomfortable, go home today and Google crucifixion. Jesus chose righteousness over his own personal safety and comfort. And by the way, he doesn't even choose to live in the gray area. Can we just have a moment of confession? I'll do it verbally, okay? You guys can just do it all quietly. Are we, are we not guilty of just living in the gray area everywhere? Little white lie, little lie on our taxes, little lie about being busy, little lie about what we write on social media. We all just live in this gray area, not where Jesus lived. Do you know where Jesus lived? He lived at the center of the bullseye of the will of God. He lived a life of love, truth, integrity, and righteousness, and that was it. And do you know what that led him to? Not only did it lead him to the cross, but do you know what it led him to? When he chose to live in the word, in the very center, in the will of God, it led him to the place where he found his purpose and his destiny and his life was fulfilled. Is that not what we're all looking for? Aren't we all looking for, man, what, what is my purpose? What vision does God have for my life? Where does God want me to go and what does he want me to do? And I I really just want to live a life that's fulfilled. Like that is what we are all chasing as either Christians or Americans or American Christians. We're all chasing that thing. And so the question is, how do I get to the place where I'm living a purposeful life, fulfilling my destiny and feeling satisfied in the Lord? Well, let me tell you, I have no wise words about this other than the way of the master 
If you want to live a life where you fulfill your destiny, you find purpose, and you feel satisfied in the life that you're living, look no farther than the life that Jesus lived. He lived a life of truth, of righteousness. He sacrificed his own comfort and his own safety for others. He lived in the very center of the will of God. He stayed on the path even when it was hard. When the Spirit of God told him, yes, he went. When the Spirit of God told him, no, he didn't go. We can boil it down that simply. Stay on the path. Strive for righteousness. Live by truth. Sacrifice your own comfort for the love and the care of others. And I promise you, that you will find the very same thing that Jesus found. Which, by the way, can sometimes be the valley of the shadow of death. Do you know when Jesus chose this righteous act to speak into the Pharisees and into the Sadducees more? He was choosing to walk into the shadow of death. By the way, this is my very favorite thing to say at a memorial service or a funeral. Because we read this passage, Psalm 23, and we think, it's such a sad psalm, but it's fitting because it talks about death. Do you know something? Psalm 23 is nothing about death. It's only about life. It's only the shadow of death. It is only the shadow of death. You see, when you choose to follow the will of God, there are going to be moments in your life where that shadow comes over you. And there is difficult moments. And there are moments when you will, like Jesus, be like, God, will you please just take this cup from me? I can't bear it. There will be seasons and moments of your life. You've been there, church. You've battled over your marriage. You've battled cancer. You have battled addiction. You've battled those things. You know what the valley of the shadow of death is like. But I have to remind you, it is only a shadow. And do you know what's on the other side? The same thing. The very same thing is on the other side for you that was on the other side for Jesus. Jesus goes for a f through a few moments of very difficult life. And then on the other side of that is immediate resurrection and reconciliation. Immediate. Church, I just have to tell you, when you're work walking through the hardest days of your life, when you're walking through the valley of the shadow of death, maybe you're there right now, maybe you've been there, maybe you're going to be there again someday, and just remember that it is only the shadow of death. What Psalm 23 says is that even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, this is what God does. He says he prepares a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Do you know what this is a picture of? David was a warrior. He wasn't just a king. He led an army. This is a picture of David sitting on a hill with a table of banquet food in front of him looking down in the valley at thousands of soldiers who were coming to attack his land. And he says, you know what God does? He just laughs at those armies. He says, in front of those armies, he just prepares a table of food, a banquet for me. And he protects me, he comforts me, he gives me peace, he fills my cup with blessing and Holy Spirit so much that it overflows. He chases me my entire life with goodness and mercy. And I know that no matter what happens on this planet, that someday I am going to end up in the house in the presence of God forever. Do you see, church? Psalm 23 is not about death, it is about life and victory in the name of Jesus Christ. Do not miss that. Take heart. Take heart if you are hurting. Take heart if you are suffering. Take heart if you are discouraged. This too will pass. Stay on the path. Okay, three more verses and we're done. I'm going to make it quick, I promise. Verses 45 through 47. 45 through 40, 45 through 47. And in the hearing of all the people, he said to his disciples... Beware of the scribes. By the way, the scribes, Pharisees, Sadducees, all a part of that ruling religious political class, okay? Beware of the scribes who like to walk around in long robes and love greetings in the marketplaces and the best seats in the synagogues and the places of honor at feasts, who devour widows' houses and for a pretense make long prayers. They will receive even greater condemnation. I have a lot to say here. I'm going to boil it down in one minute. Jesus, after confronting the Sadducees, and the Pharisees and the scribes were right there. They're standing right in front of him. He's confronted them. He's told them truth right to their face. He's told them things that are going to lead to him being on the cross. He turns around to his disciples. 
you have to understand the drama of this moment. He turns around to his disciples and he says, those people over there, they're fake. They are frauds. Not you guys. I love you guys over here, okay? I should have pointed out there. But in a serious moment, with them standing right in front of him, Jesus says, those men do not love me. Those men speak of me, but their hearts are not with me. Those men dress in great robes, and they walk around with tablets of the word of scrolls, with the word of God, and they make these long prayers. But he says, their hearts are not with me. Oh, church, we cannot be like that. This is, this is not the only place that this is spoken of in the Bible. I, I picked just two other verses for you to see today as we close. Matthew 15 is the first one. <laughs> Good job. This people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. And 1 Samuel. But the Lord said to Samuel... Do not look on his appearance or the height of his stature, because I have rejected him. For the Lord sees not as man sees. Man looks at the outward appearance. It's okay, I got it. (laughs) But the Lord looks at the heart. Church, here's what matters. It doesn't matter how well you can pray your prayer. It doesn't matter how well you can speak. It doesn't matter what car you drove up in. It doesn't matter what clothes you're wearing today. It doesn't matter the tattoos that are on your skin. Your old life doesn't matter. The addiction that you lived in, it matters no longer. Do you know what matters? It's just this. And it's not the fleshly thing that's beating in your heart. It's your soul. It's your soul that makes you who you are. That's what God wants. He wants you to turn over to him everything about you. Your heart your soul, and your life. He he is not impressed by anything we do. He is not impressed by any haircut we get. He is only impressed when we give, when we give him our heart. And so that's what I want to send you to communion with, church. Before we finish up today, before we go to lunch, before we do whatever else we're going to do, I want you to go to communion for a moment with this Examine your heart. It doesn't matter what you've said. It doesn't matter how well or how much you've read the Bible. All that matters is, does God have your heart? And so spend a couple of moments. The, the worship team will, will begin to play a little bit, but we're just going to keep it quiet for a couple of minutes. Take some time to reflect. Take some time to allow the spirit of the living God to convict you as you need to be convicted. Allow him to mold and shape your heart and soften it. And if there are any things that are separating you from God, if there's any sin or any stumbling blocks or anything, this is the time to turn it over. This is the time to give it up. This is the time to say, Lord, you have my heart. No more of this. No more of that. No more of all of that. Father, you have my heart. That's our act of communion this morning, church, is that we make sure our heart is right with the Lord. And then the beauty of communion is this. After we've spent that time communing with the Lord, then we go get up and we go to one of the communion stations. There's two or three around the back. And we get to remember and celebrate the reason we have life. The reason we have life is that Jesus went to the cross, that his blood was spilled, that his body was broken, so that we could be forgiven and live this new life that he's given us. So spend a few minute, moments with the Lord. As you're ready, go back to one of the communion tables that are in the back. Take the elements, bring them back to your chair. And as you're ready, between you and the Lord in prayer, take communion, remembering and celebrating Jesus. Let's pray. Father, we don't want to be like this. Father, we don't want to be like the scribes. We don't want to be like the scribes who put on a good face, but, are, but inside, Father, we're just dark. Father, we don't want to be like the Sadducees who walk around trying to trip other people up and trying to knock other people down a peg. Father, we don't want to be like the Pharisees who burned with jealousy and anger. Father, we want to be, oh, Father, we want to be people who are after you. We want to be people who are filled with you. 
We want to be people who have hearts for you. So, Father, I pray now that your spirit who's here moving and dwelling around us and inside of us, Father, would do a great work in our hearts. Convict us as we need convicting. Encourage us as we need encouragement. Reveal to us, Father, the things we need to turn over to you. And, Father, draw us all the more closer during these couple of moments where we relate, commune, and pray. Father, meet us, be with us, work in us, we pray. In Jesus' name. Amen. Take a moment to be with the Lord as you're ready. Go to communion. Thank mm-hmm. you.